Hi, my name is Danuli and I'm a final year PhD candidate with the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. So it's a pleasure to be able to share my presentation with you all today. And I will be speaking about the risk of dementia in individuals with a history of trauma and adverse childhood events. So dementia is an umbrella term referring to several diseases which are characterized by cognitive decline, and they are also more common in later life. So the symptoms of dementia include, but aren't limited to impairments in learning, memory, language, and self-care. On a global scale, 50 million people worldwide are suffering from dementia. And as you can see in the figure shown, this number is expected to increase to 152 million people by the year 2050. So how can we reduce the burden of dementia? So it's estimated that a third of dementia cases could potentially be prevented or delayed by reducing modifiable risk factors. So let's talk about some risk factors for dementia. The greatest known risk factors for dementia are non-modifiable, and these include increasing age and genetic factors. However, it may be possible to reduce one's risk of dementia by targeting modifiable risk factors, which range from physical inactivity to head injury or low education and even social isolation. There is increasing evidence in the literature to suggest that the psychological stress associated with adverse life events could also be a potentially modifiable risk factor for dementia if it is treated and managed accordingly. So how do adverse life events impact the brain and dementia risk? Experiencing an adverse life event in some cases can lead to a dysregulated stress response. This could result in the release of stress mediators, which can then target receptors in cognitive brain regions, including the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, and hippocampus, as shown in the diagram. Over time, this could lead to the atrophy of the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, and also the overactivation of the amygdala. So these volumetric and functional changes to these cognitive areas can affect working memory, emotional memory, and long-term memory formation. There is also some evidence to show that these effects may be more severe and permanent if the event is traumatic in nature. For example, a life-threatening event such as a motor vehicle accident or if the event occurs in early life during rapid brain development. As these brain changes and subsequent signs and symptoms also occur with dementia, it is possible that the psychological stress associated with adverse life events may be a potential risk factor for this disease. So this brings me to the aim of my study, so I looked at to what extent does lifetime trauma or adverse childhood event, events impact dementia risk? To answer this question, I utilized data from the ongoing France-based Esprit study. So Esprit is a large cohort study of 1,700 community-dwelling men and women aged over 65 who were free of dementia at baseline. The aim of the Esprit study is to evaluate the risks, incidents, and treatment of psychiatric disorders in older people. In this cohort, the mean age was 72.6 years old, and the majority of participants were female, and approximately 35% of participants had finished their secondary school education. How are the variables measured? So looking at the exposure variables, 
adverse childhood events were measured using a modified version of the childhood trauma questionnaire. Nine specific events were measured, such as childhood poverty and death of a parent. However, because previous studies have shown that an accumulation of adverse childhood events is associated with an increased risk of poor health outcomes in later life, I focused on a cumulative variable. Lifetime trauma was assessed with the Watson's PTSD inventory, which also measured the, pres the presence of PTSD. So what is PTSD? It's a clinical condition that can arise after witnessing or experiencing, <coughs> sorry, a life-threatening event, or in other words, a traumatic event. So the outcomes measured include baseline cognitive function across five domains, including global cognition, visual memory, verbal fluency, psychomotor speed, and executive function. And these are all assessed using a battery of cognitive tests. Dementia was also measured across 14 years, according to DSM-4 criteria. So now focusing on the statistical analysis used to measure these associations. Associations between the exposure variables, so adverse childhood events and lifetime trauma and PTSD, and the outcome variable of baseline cognitive function was assessed with multivariate logistic regression. The association between the exposure variables and dementia incidents across 14 years was measured using a Cox proportional hazards regression. All analyses were conducted using state of 15 and were adjusted for a range of sociodemographic, lifestyle and health factors. So now for the results with adverse childhood events, participants were grouped according to whether they had two or less events, three to four events, or more than five events. 46% of participants experienced less than two adverse childhood events. 31% experienced between three to four adverse events. And 22% experienced more than five adverse events. It was found that a higher number of adverse childhood events in comparison to two or less events was associated with worse psychomotor speed and verbal fluency. Psychomotor speed as defined by the speed of cognitive processing and verbal, verbal fluency is defined by information retrieval from memory. In particular, the risk of worse psychomotor speed increased from 34% in participants with three to four events to 52% in participants who experienced five or more events. No associations were observed between adverse childhood events and incident dementia. And there were approximately 9.7% of participants who were diagnosed with dementia after 14 years. So now for the results with lifetime trauma, the frequency of lifetime PTSD in the sample was 2.4%, which is quite low. So I analyzed the frequency of lifetime trauma. 45% of the sample did not report any lifetime trauma. The remainder of participants who did report trauma were grouped according to whether they had the PTSD symptoms of re-experiencing symptoms, meaning recurring dreams, hallucinations, or flashbacks of the traumatic event. So as, as expected, in comparison to those with no lifetime trauma, trauma was associated with worse global cognition, and this is in participants with re-experiencing symptoms. But surprisingly, participants who had undergone a trauma without re-experiencing symptoms, sorry, 
they showed better global cognition, better executive function, and a reduced risk of dementia. If we focus on the results with adverse childhood events, our results suggest that a high number of adverse childhood events <coughs> sorry, are associated with worse cognition in adulthood, particularly psychomotor speed. And this may be due to the developing nature of the brain in early life, which is more susceptible to the effects of stress than in other stages of life. And this may lead to more permanent changes in cognitive brain regions in later life. However, there were no significant observations with dementia. So it's unclear why most of our associations were observed only with psychomotor speed and not with the other cognitive domains, but it may be possible that, <coughs> sorry, that the decline in cognitive processing speed in aging proceeds uh, and precipitates the decline in higher level functions, such as executive functioning. However, if we now focus on our results with lifetime trauma, we see the opposite effect, and that in cases without re-experiencing symptoms, there seems to be a protective effect towards low cognitive decline and incident in dementia. So one possible explanation is that these participants have undergone a process called post-traumatic growth. And this theory proposes that extreme stress or trauma, <coughs> sorry, can cause individuals to question and subsequently reevaluate their core beliefs, their self-identity and worldview. So this can result in a positive shift in thinking and a more heightened level of functioning than if they had never experienced a traumatic event. Limited studies suggest that increased post-traumatic growth may increase neural network decorrelation, which is the process of a neural network being freed from a particular input, such as an intrusive thought following a traumatic event, <coughs> so it is able to encode new information. This process of breaking and building neural connections may be important in strengthening pathways involved in improving cognition and protection against dementia. In conclusion, experiencing an adverse life event may not always be associated with cognitive decline. In some cases, experiencing adversity can actually improve cognition. <coughs> Therefore, the effect of adversity on cognition may be dependent on various factors. The differences in our results could be due to when the event was experienced, whether it be childhood or throughout the lifespan. Or it could be due to if the event was classified as an unexpected traumatic event such as a motor vehicle accident, as opposed to ongoing chronic stress, such as childhood poverty. Or it could be due to whether the participant reports psychological symptoms associated with the event. Therefore, further research is required to determine in which circumstances adverse life events could increase or decrease one's risk of low cognition or dementia in later life. In doing so, this could contribute to the implementation of psychosocial intervention efforts for people who have undergone adverse life events in order to improve the quality of life in older people. I would like to acknowledge my supervisors at Monash University and the participants in the S3 study. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Heather Craig. And today I would like to share a study that we have done looking at the socioeconomic, behavioural and social health correlates of optimism and pessimism in older Australians. Today I am presenting on the unceded territory that is the lands of the Kulin Nation. 
I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to the Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal elders who may be here with us today. Globally, the proportion of the population that is aged 65 years or older is increasing. And along with this comes increases in age-related diseases, such as cognitive impairment, cardiovascular disease and certain cancers. This is costly, both economically for countries and also to individuals. Positive epidemiology suggests that we should investigate factors which can promote the functional capacity of individuals, that is, to enable people to be able to do what is meaningful to them. Health assets are such protective factors and include physiological, behavioural and psychosocial characteristics, and these can mitigate the risk of chronic disease in older age. Optimism is one such health asset. There is no one commonly accepted definition of optimism. However, there are two predominant theories. One theory relates to how people interpret and explain events in their life. An optimist would explain that negative events or problems are not going to last forever, they're not pervasive and they're not the person's fault. And this is termed explanatory style. The other, which was the focus of our study, was dispos is dispositional optimism. With a heritability of around 25%, dispositional optimism is a relatively stable personality trait that relates to future expectancies, such that an optimist believes that more positive things than negative things will happen in the future. Pessimism, on the other hand, can be understood as expecting the worst thing to happen. It was once thought that optimism and pessimism occurred on a continuum, from most pessimistic to most optimistic. That is, that optimism and pessimism were the unidimensional or degrees of the same thing. However, more recently it's been suggested that the optimism and pessimism are independent constructs, so that a person is not either a pessimist or an optimist. Rather, they may be highly optimistic about some things, but moderately pessimistic about others. This slide shows some of the associations between optimism, pessimism and health outcomes. Higher optimism is associated with lowered risk of cognitive impairment in late life, as well as less risk of coronary heart disease. Moreover, higher optimism predicts greater quality of life for informal caregivers. And in my published systematic review, I reported that optimism is associated with less risk of premature mortality, whereas pessimism is associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality. Optimism has been positive, found to be positively associated with longevity. However, there is little research into how optimism may be associated with health in those who reach older age relatively well. Research is a priority in adults aged 70 years and older because it's been demonstrated that at this stage in life, optimism begins to decrease while pessimism increases. It's been demonstrated that relatively simple psychological interventions are effective in promoting optimism. However, less is known about which factors might be targeted in public health promotion interventions to increase optimism and decrease pessimism. And this brings me to the study I will describe today. So the aim of our study was to look at a range of socioeconomic, behavioural and social health factors and to determine their association with optimism and pessimism and determine whether correlates of optimism were distinct from those of pessimism. The data we used was from a spree, which is the aspirin reducing events in the elderly study, a large clinical trial designed to assess whether a low dose of aspirin daily was associated with health of older adults. The trial commenced in March 2010 and concluded in January 2018. And specifically, I used a sub-study called ALSOP, and this study included roughly 13,000 Australian adults aged 70 years and older and provided data on various factors associated with health in ageing. And ALSOP commenced in 2012. This slide presents the process which was involved in the selection of our final sample. So from the initial cohort of almost 20,000 Esprit participants, there were just under 15,000 Australians who also participated in ALSOP. 
For our sample, we included those older adults for whom we had complete data, including the optimism measure, which I'll introduce in a moment. Our final sample was therefore just over 10,000 people with approximately equal proportion of men and women. So we used audit logistic regression to measure the odds of higher optimism and lower pessimism in the sample associated with a range of factors, which included years of education, annual household income, a measure of relatively a relative socioeconomic advantage, which was based on residential area, smoking status, level of alcohol intake, physical activity, activity levels, engagement in volunteer work, social support, loneliness, and social isolation. And as I described earlier, there was some disagreement as to whether optimism and pessimism should be measured independently or on a continuum. So we compared the results for both the independent and the unidimensional scores. So this questionnaire is the revised life orientation test, which we use to measure optimism. Participants indicate their agreement with each statement on a six point Likert scale. The lot R is one of the tools assessed, used to assess optimism. And there are also others, both val validated and non-validated. And you can see here that three items have an asterisk. And this denotes the questions which measure pessimism. And when we use an unidimensional score, we reverse scored those pessimism items such that a score of five, that is the person chooses agree for a pessimism statement, it's then converted to a two. And then all of the items would be summed to give an overall measure of optimism and pessimism. So I'll now describe the participants in the study. And you can see here that the majority of participants fell into the youngest age category with almost two thirds aged between 70 and 74 years. So in this figure with the data for women in darker blue, the only factor which was not significantly different for men and women was relative socioeconomic advantage. Men were more likely to have more than 12 years of education, be married, live with others, and live in a home with a higher household income. Furthermore, men were more likely to be physically active, be a current or a former smoker, drink risky levels of alcohol, and not do volunteer work. Finally, while men were less likely to be lonely, they were more likely to be socially isolated and have low social support. You can see here that women were slightly more optimistic than men and less pessimistic. The error bars show the standard deviation and these differences were statistically significant. So these are the results of the regression models for men and women in the likelihood of being more or less optimistic. So the dash in the middle of the forest plot indicates an odds ratio of one, that is no difference in the odds of being more or less pessimistic. So points on the left indicate lower odds of being optimistic and points of the right show higher odds of being optimistic. For women only, greater age and earning between $20,000 and $99,999 per year was associated with higher odds of being optimistic, while being a smoker and having low social support was associated with lower odds of being optimistic. For both men and women, having more than 12 years education, being more physically active and doing volunteer work had higher odds of being optimistic while drinking risky levels of alcohol, being lonely and being socially isolated were associated with lower odds of being optimistic. And this forest plot shows the odds of being more or less pessimistic. So for women only, living alone and drinking alcohol at low risk levels was associated with lower odds of being pessimistic. While for men, uh, for men only, being a former drinker was associated with higher odds of being pessimistic. For both men and women, having more than 12 years of education, earning a higher income, being more socioeconomically advantaged, being more physically active and doing volunteer work was associated with lower odds of being pessimistic. 
On the other hand, being lonely and having low social support was associated with increased odds of pessimism. And our results did not differ when a unidimensional measure of optimism and pessimism was used. That higher optimism and lower pessimism in more educated individuals could relate to associated improvements in their quality of life and overall living standards. While older adults with higher income may be more optimistic as they have access to material resources, which affords greater confidence in the retirement years. Similarly, healthy lifestyle behaviours may reflect an, op an aspect of optimism, such that optimistic individuals may have the belief that their choices will successfully promote well-being. Engagement with volunteering may promote optimism by giving a sense of meaning in life, and good social health brings a sense of identity as well as various social roles. We suggested that the gender differences we reported may reflect underlying cultural aspects such as gender roles and socialization. So maximizing socioeconomic conditions for older adults, as well as encouraging healthy lifestyle behaviors and promoting good social health is likely to increase the odds of older adults being more optimistic and less pessimistic. And recalling those positive health outcomes associated with greater optimism and lower pessimism, all in all, it's a win-win situation. So perhaps the most significant limitation was the cross-sectional study design, so we cannot determine our causality. And furthermore, although the sample was considered representative of adults who live in Australia and reach later life in relative good health, we acknowledge that many older adults live with multimorbidity, so this may limit the generalizability of findings. Those who volunteer for a long-term clinical trial may also be more optimistic than other individuals. Finally, many measures were self-reported. So we noted a report, reporting bias, which may be particularly relevant for less socially desirable behavioral factors such as smoking. So in summary, in a sample of adults who reached late life free of life-limiting disease and major disability, we concluded that favourable socioeconomic conditions, healthy lifestyle and good social health are associated with an increased likelihood of optimism and decreased likelihood of pessimism. We found that women had higher odds of optimism and lower odds of pessimism than men. And we noted some gender differences in the correlates of optimism and pessimism. So we suggest that by promoting the health and well-being of older adults, we are also likely to increase their optimism, which will have its own health benefits. So I'd just like to pass my thanks on to the IOGG for the opportunity to share our research today. The uh, many Australians who took part in Astray, Esprit, and all others who've made this study possible. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation today. I'm Aung Pyo from the Monash School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine, Monash University, Melbourne, Australia. The topic I'm going to present today is trajectory of physical heart-related quality of life in older people and the risks of incident cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. The first part of my talk deals with background. What is physical heart? Physical heart is not merely the state of being free of illness or disability. It is an individual ability to live comfortably and to perform daily tasks that they want to do. Physical heart is one of the main components of overall heart. Therefore, poor physical heart can affect the other dimension of heart, such as mental, emotional, and spiritual heart. This in turn could negatively impact on overall well being and quality of life. In this 21st century, a paradigm shift toward patient center care has occurred in medical care. This patient center care has been widely recognized as a fundamental principle of high quality health system. Therefore, the role of patient reported outcome measure has gained attention in healthcare setting. 
what is patient reported or can measures patient reported or can measure are standardized questionnaires that capture an individual perception of their own heart heart related quality of life is one of the most widely used patient reported or can measure in heart care it is a multi dimensional concept including physical mental and social health domain it is an assessment of how individual feels about their heart what is physical heart related quality of life physical heart related quality of life is an assessment of the impact of physical heart condition on individual daily lives in our recent systematic review and meta analysis it consists of 47 study most of them were conducted in europe and the united states in this systematic review we found that physical heart related quality of life has a stronger predicted ability for mortality risks compared to mental heart related quality of life further in literature it has been increasingly suggested that physical heart related quality of life is an effective predictor of of us heart outcomes in community dwelling older individuals. In our previous data analysis, using a large cohort of approximately 90,000 relatively healthy older people aged 65 years and above, we found that higher physical heart related quality of life at the baseline was associated with decreased risk of incident cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality. However, physical heart related quality of life is susceptible to change over time, especially among the older individual. So, assessing physical heart related quality of life over time may better capture an individual risk of future heart events than the single time assessment. Therefore, however, to date, all prior study demonstrating the predicted power of the physical heart related quality of life for the risk of cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality have only used a single time assessment or have examined changes in the physical heart related quality of life between two time points. Therefore, we added a new perspective to this field by examining whether physical heart related quality of life trajectory predict subsequent risks of fatal and non fatal cardiovascular disease events and all cause mortality in community dwelling older people. To address these objectives, we have the opportunity to use the longitudinal data of ASPRI study. ASPRI is the aspirin in the reducing event in the artery. It is a clinical trial on the effect of the low dose aspirin for primary prevention in all the people. Aspirin include a large cohort of relatively healthy older people, aged 65 years and above, from Australia and the United States. This is a timeline of my analysis. Physical heart related quality of life was assessed at the baseline and over six follow-up during the S3 trial period. For the heart outcomes, we consider incident heart outcomes that are occurring during the S3 X3 period. Physical heart related quality of life trajectory was the determinant of this study. Heart related quality of life was measured at the baseline over six follow-up using the SF12 version two. Physical domain of heart-related quality of life was generated using the standardized NAM-based method. Higher score indicate better physical heart-related quality of life. We use the growth mixture modeling to identify physical heart-related quality of life trajectory. Our study consists of three main heart outcomes, incident cardiovascular disease, fatal cardiovascular disease, or cause mortality. Incident cardiovascular disease consists of 
fatal coronary heart disease, non-fatal myocardial infarction, fatal or non-fatal stroke, or the hospitalization for heart failure. This is a flow diagram showing how incident cardiovascular disease was adjudicated. Case summary. Detailed medical record, imaging documentation were used during the adjudication process. After that, adjudication committee review all available information and adjudicate incident cardiovascular disease. For the data analysis, we used a logistic regression. We also fitted the possible interaction between physical heart-related quality of life trajectory and gender or age group in the logistic regression models. This slide shows the physical heart-related quality of life trajectory among the older people over the median 4.7 years follow-up. We can see in this figure that most of the older people had a good physical heart-related quality of life over time. Approximately 13% of the cohort had a remarkable increase during the first two years. After that, a slight decrease. Another 13% of the cohort has a remarkable decline over the first three years. After that, had a slight fracturation. The minority, 6.5% of the cohort, had a low physical heart-related quality of life over time. This slide shows the characteristics of study participants. This study includes approximately 16,000 study participants aged 65 years and above. Half of them were female, 12 year plus education, living with family or others. 91% of the cohort were white Australian or white American. Compared to the dose in the high physical heart related quality of life group, participants in either low or declining physical heart related quality of life group were more likely to be older, female, have less education, be living alone, and had more comorbidity. Over an average two years follow up, we found that. 406 incident cardiovascular disease, approximately 200 fatal cardiovascular disease, and 751 all cause mortality. This slide shows the association between physical heart related quality of life trajectory and incident risk of heart outcomes. We can see in this table that the decline physical heart-related quality of life trajectory has a, the highest risk of developing incident cardiovascular disease, whereas a low physical heart-related quality of life trajectory has the highest risk of fatal cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. Our findings were not different by gender and age group. To conclude, our study is the first study investigating the association between physical heart-related quality of life trajectory and incident heart outcomes. Low physical heart-related quality of life trajectory predict an incident risk, increased risk of fatal cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. Declining physical heart-related quality of life could be considered as an early indicator for incident risk of cardiovascular disease. The finding of the, this study strengthened the importance of physical heart-related quality of life in the heart risk assessment for the older people in the primary care setting. Our study has been published in American Journal Plus, Cardiology Research and Practice. So, for those who are interested in our finding, full test can be available using this QR code. Here are the list of the reference we use 
in this presentation. Thank you for the attending this presentation. Thank you, my co-author. Thank you, Monash University Scholarship for my PhD project. Thank you, ASPRI collaborator, ASPRI staff, and the ASPRI participant. Thank you, Monash School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine, Monash University, Australia. Thank you. Have a good day. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'd like to thank the IAJG for having us um, and for us being able to present uh, today. So I'll just introduce myself. My name is Danuli. And I, together with Ang and Heather, uh, we have presented a symposium and uh, it is titled How the Psychological Well-Being of Older Adults Can Influence Their Health. Unfortunately, Heather is sick and unable to join us, but she welcomes any questions or, or feedback about her presentation through email. So we are all PhD candidates um, with the School of Biological Neuropsychiatry and Dementia team. So part of the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University in Australia. So uh, my presentation was looking at uh, the risk of dementia in older individuals who had experienced a traumatic event across the lifespan or an adverse event specific to childhood. I have a question here from Katrina Davis, um, who asked a very good question uh, regarding if there were any measures that I would have liked to study, uh, if I wish I could have, and uh, what future cohort studies should also include. Uh, so this is a really good question uh, because there was an important variable that unfortunately uh, the data that I used didn't collect um, and this was how individual people may perceive stressful or traumatic events. So one individual uh, might judge a certain event as extremely stressful, whereas another individual might perceive that event as a rather trivial event. So we only measured uh, having the experience of the event, but not the individual perceptions of that event. So it seems reasonable to expect that uh, stressful events are uh, experienced as more negative and thought of as more negative by individuals have a more adverse influence on a, a person's health. So I think that's a very important variable to uh, collect in future studies. Um, would you uh, like to maybe discuss uh, some of the potential mechanisms in your associations? Uh, yes. And the exact mechanisms and the underlying the association between the physical heart rate quality of life and the cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality is a stay unclear. But in the ASAP trial version two, heart rate quality of life questionnaire, in which and that there are some questions related to the whether individual physical heart impact on their daily life. So poor physical heart related quality of life could reflect individual perceiving limitation on their daily activity due to the overall poor heart. On the other hand, there's a feeling extremely exhausted after the during the daily activities, muscle pain, fatigue. It may be the common symptoms of the older people experience before being the diagnosis of the heart disease and the other age-related disease. So our poor physical heart-related quality of life reflecting the poor overall physical heart could be the emerging risk indicator for the heart disease, cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, and the even in the all cause mortality. So, this is the I thought that the further study may be required to investigate some of this possible mechanics in underlying between the this NOVA association. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
So regarding my study as well, yeah. um, the potential mechanisms, um, there, there is some evidence um, regarding biological mechanisms uh, in the association between stress and dementia. Yeah. So one possible mechanism could be the dysregulation of the HPA axis, which is responsible for the stress response. So dysregulation of this HPA axis can lead to uh, dysregulated levels of glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, which is a okay. hormone, hormonal mediator in the stress response. And this hormone binds to brain regions involved in both the stress response and in cognitive functions. So uh, brain regions such as the hippocampus, the amygdala, and prefrontal cortex, for example. Yeah. This then may lead to damage in cognitive brain regions and uh, could potentially accelerate the progression of dementia and cognitive decline in older age. Uh, so this is just one uh, theory, but there are other theories also relating to this association and they focus on increased oxidative stress and neuroinflammation, which are both increased uh, in chronically stressed individuals. So it's possible that overactivation of these mechanisms uh, can influence neuronal cell death and damage to cognitive brain regions and also possibly impact the neuropathology involved in Alzheimer's disease, um, such as amyloid uh, plaque deposition and also even telomere shortening. Um, so these are all biological mechanisms uh, which could potentially explain the relationship between stress and dementia. And um, But we also have to consider psychosocial factors to explain these associations. Uh, so factors such as social support and loneliness uh, were not considered in my study because those variables weren't um, collected. Uh, so this also ties into Katrina's question. So future studies could definitely also consider social support and loneliness because it is quite possible that these um, will increase the risk of dementia and low cognition in older age. However, we unfortunately didn't have that data collected. It's really interesting. So Sandal, what would be the potential implication of your study? Yeah, so the potential implications of my study, um, because there were also some gender differences observed in my study, which I didn't go into too much detail, um, the potential implication could be um, clinically to promote psychosocial interventions for older people and specifically gender-based approaches to these interventions might be more uh, clinically relevant. And in doing so, this could um, hopefully reduce the risk of low cognitive decline and dementia risk um, in older people who have suffered from adverse events throughout their life. Thanks for the question, Ang. What about the yeah. clinical implications for your project? Yes, and uh, for, for in, in my studies, and uh, I found that Decline in physical heart rate, the quality of life trajectory over the uh, median of the 4.7 years follow up was associated with the increased risk of the incident cardiovascular disease. So, and the, it strengthens the benefit of the regular physical heart rate, the quality of life screening for the older people. On the other hand, and the, our as free cohort was the diverse in terms of the age gentle, social economic status, education level, and then set other heart, chronic heart conditions such as the diabetics and the hypertension, which are usually found in the older people. So in the, my study cohort, uh, the finding from this cohort could be the, uh, generalizable to the community trained older people who are commonly seen in the primary care setting. So our study finding also support the incorporation of the patient reported outcome measure, such as heart-related quality of life into the annual heart checklist in the 
for the older people in the primary care settings and to identify the risks of their heart outcomes. Additionally, our study also strengthens the uh, previous literature, such as the uh, heart-related quality of life could be considered as a part of the cardiovascular disease and the other uh, heart risk assessment for the older people in the primary care setting. It is a potential implication from my study. So Senator, for the next, for the future studies and the, based on the, this finding, I will, I will recommend Senator to investigate and the possible interventions to improve the quality of life and then so the whether uh, is there association with the decreased risk of the incident had outcomes? It will be the future study. Yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. Um, what are some ways do you think that we can improve the quality of life? Um, actually, and we didn't in the literature and the most of the study were conducted in the patient population and then some patient with the cancer or patient with the other chronic disease. In this case, and the, they usually recommend the mindfulness and then physical activity and the tire plans and the, for as a, as a potential implication, a potential intervention to increase the heart-related quality of life, especially for the physical activity and the diet. So and the, they call the lifestyle interventions. Well, would social support also play a role in um, increasing quality of life? Yes. Uh, one of my uh, chapter from my PhD thesis, and the, they also found that and the loneliness was associated with uh, uh, a vast physical heart-related quality of life. So and the, we could... And then and another interesting finding from that study is uh, volunteering can prevent uh, declining the physical heart-related quality of life. So and the, we can say that uh, a volunteering program for the older people could improve the, their well-being and the overall quality of life, which in turn and that could decrease the risk of the incident heart outcomes. Yeah, that's really interesting. Did the study only look at volunteering programs or did yeah. it also look at other um, forms of social networking? Yes, yeah, so and um, the limitation of the, that study is uh, we do not have that data and we do not have the information about the specific voluntary program. So and the, based on the, that study, and the type of the voluntary programs and the frequency of the voluntary programs. So we need to investigate the detail about the that and then some the weather and the, the association with the overall well-being in the in the older people. Okay, great. That's really interesting. So would you recommend uh, older people uh, pick up maybe volunteering in order to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease events? Would that be a potential recommendation? And uh, it, I thought, Sandra, we, we need to wait Sandra, for the future study. And then, Sandra, based on the result of the future study, Sandra, we can, we can make a such kind of recommendation. Another point is uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic period, Sandra, uh, social, inter so social interaction via through the voluntary program might be the challenging. So and that we need to find the, another innovative digital technology in the find type of the intervention like the Zoom meeting or something like this. We need to create the, that kind of the, you know, uh, advanced intervention. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, very innovative as well. Yeah. So and that there's no question from the audience. Uh, I just have a comment um, from Katrina saying that uh, that we could also look at the reimagining and cognitive load. So 
too much brain involved in reliving the old stress. Yes, that's that's true. Um, so regarding stress, um, it, it can definitely affect cognitive load. And not enough left for cognition. Uh, yes, that's true. So uh, stress can definitely affect these cognitive brain regions in that way. Um, and then also Ung's finding strengthens the idea that health is not just a lack of disease uh, because heart disease is dichotomous, but health is a continuum. And then so that we saw that so that on COVID outcomes, where we only look at the diagnostics or the best should look at the heart-related quality of life, right? Because in, the, in this the patient-centric errors, and we also focus on the patient-reported heart outcome measures and heart, such as the heart-related quality of life. So as an announce and based on the my studies, and the, we we can uh, recommend something like that and the heart-related quality of life as a predictive uh, potential predictive tools for the incident heart outcomes for the older peoples. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for your uh, comments and questions, Katrina. Um, and that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes.